Intermolecular force is going to be the topic of this first lesson in a chapter on solids and liquids. We'll follow this up with a, a discussion of what are called phase diagrams and then finish this chapter off by talking about the structures and types of solids. Now, intermolecular forces, so if we break down that word here, so inter means between separate, like interstate commerce would be like when businesses operate in more than one state, they, more than one state, they do uh, commerce in different states. So, but intermolecular means between separate molecules and then forces. So these are forces between separate molecules. So if you look, typically the force that actually holds a molecule together are gonna be covalent bonds. Well, that's not what we're talking about here. So here, if you have a molecule over here and a molecule over here, there's a rather weak attractive force, at least weak compared to, say, the strength of a covalent bond. And these forces we will lump together and call intermolecular forces. And you should recognize that they're far weaker than covalent bonds, far weaker than ionic bonds, usually on the scale of like, at best, at their strongest, like maybe 25 times weaker, and at worst, like maybe, you know, hundreds of times weaker. So uh, much, much weaker than ionic and covalent bonds. Now, I'll allude back to chapter nine as well when we talked about gases. If you recall, for ideal gases, we said there were no attractive forces between molecules. Well, again, that wasn't technically 100% true, and I kind of alluded to the fact that we would talk about some of these forces of attraction between the molecules, and that's what we're talking about here with these intermolecular forces. These are attractive forces between the molecules, and they're going to fall in one of three major categories, and I'll add a fourth that I'll really talk about very briefly, but they're going to start off by falling into these three major categories. And the big thing you have to understand to understand these intermolecular forces is plus and minus. Pluses are attracted to minuses as far as charge goes. It is amazing how much of the physical properties and chemical properties in all of chemistry so come down to plus and minus. Like charges repel, opposite charges attract. And in this lesson, we're going to focus on those opposite charges attracting. And again, it is monumental how much of all of chemistry really does come down to plus and minus and the attraction between them. That's what holds an atom together. The nucleus at the center is positively charged, having protons. The electrons around it are negatively charged, so on and so forth. And when we form molecules and stuff, we're just now combining nuclei and having multiple electrons. And how do they come together? And the attraction, as well as repulsions, in some cases, nuclei repel each other, electrons repel each other. So, but how does that balance out to form molecules? And it is, again, remarkable how much of it all really does come down to this plus and minus. So, we're going to start with the one in the middle here. So, but I've kind of got these ranked in terms of strength. Dip uh, these London dispersion forces, uh, also called Van der Waals forces, are the weakest. Then dipole-dipole forces, and then finally hydrogen bonding. Generally, look at the strongest of these three intermolecular forces. And we'll start with these dipole-dipole forces. And we talked about molecules that have a dipole. These are the molecules that we describe as being polar, that have partial positive, partial negative charges. And so, the one I like to use here is. HCl. So if you take a look at HCl, there is a dipole moment. Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, and that's going to make the chlorine partially negatively charged and the hydrogen partially positively charged. So we represent this with either partial positive, partial negative, where that is the Greek lowercase letter delta, and we use that for, to mean partial. So if you uh, take a, an advanced calculus class someday, you'd find out we use the same symbol to represent partial derivatives. So, but that's getting way ahead of us. Another way to represent this is sometimes we draw this kind of a line here where we draw a plus sign and then an arrow pointing towards the more electronegative uh, atom. And this arrow just allows us to identify the partially positive and partially negative sides in a different kind of way. So, but you kind of see both these commonly used and we saw this back uh, a couple of chapters ago when we did chemical bonding. So I just want to refresh you on that. And if we draw in another molecule now of HCl. And once again, this molecule has a partially positive hydrogen and a partially negative chlorine. And if you look at one single molecule, so we say we just block one of these out here. So if you look at just the one of them, what holds this hydrogen to this chlorine? Well, it's that line right there that represents a covalent bond. A covalent bond holds the molecule together. And that's not what we're talking about here. So, but if I have two separate HCl molecules, it turns out that there is a weak attraction here 
between the hydrogen of this molecule and the chlorine of this molecule. And it's all based on the fact that this hydrogen is partially positively charged and the chlorine of this molecule is partially negatively charged. And so there's this weak attraction, just plus minus. And because these are just partial charges, it's nowhere near as strong as like an ionic bond, which is a full plus or full minus charges and things of this sort. So it's nowhere near that strong. And so we can explain why this is much, much weaker than an actual ionic bond, for instance. All right, but it really is just coming down to this. Polar molecules have these dipole-dipole forces. Non-polar molecules would not have these dipole-dipole forces. And it's just that weak attraction uh, between partially positive and partially negative parts of different molecules. But again, it is between different molecules. All right, so that's dipole-dipole forces. Generally, the more polar the molecule, the stronger these forces are gonna be. All right, next on the docket is hydrogen bonding. And uh, I cover dipole-dipole forces first because hydrogen bonding is really kind of just like a super duper strong dipole-dipole forces. And it only exists if you have one of three different really, really, really polar bonds. And all of those polar bonds involve hydrogen and hence the name hydrogen bonding. Now they called it hydrogen bonding. Maybe it would have been better if they called it a hydrogen intermolecular force. Because once again, this is not an actual like ionic or covalent bond. It's at best like 25 times weaker than an actual covalent bond. So uh, maybe they should have called this hydrogen intermolecular forces, but historically it is what it is. So, but hydrogen bonding isn't an actual bond, not in the sense of a covalent bond anyways. And it doesn't mean that the only requirement is you have hydrogen, because there's lots of molecules that have hydrogen in them that aren't capable of this particular molecular force we call hydrogen bonding. However, you got to have one of these three really, really polar bonds. So, and that includes the, a bond between fluorine and hydrogen, a bond between oxygen and hydrogen, or a bond between nitrogen and hydrogen. I like to think of these as the phone elements, F-O-N. So, but if you have one of these three very polar bonds, so big differences in electronegativity between fluorine and hydrogen, between oxygen and hydrogen, and between nitrogen and hydrogen, and as a result, you end up with a significant amount of partial negative and partial positive charge. So between those two atoms. So any molecule having these then, uh, as part of their structure, will have very strong dipole-dipole forces. And they're so strong, they're so much stronger than all the other dipole-dipole forces, they decided to put them in their own separate class that they called hydrogen bonding. They all involve hydrogen, but just keep in mind, not all hydrons can participate in this. Only the hydrons bonded to F, O, or N are gonna have a significant amount of partial positive charge enough to be called hydrogen bonding. So you're most commonly gonna see this in water. So here we've got one water molecule. We'll draw another one. All right, so hydrogen bonding, it turns out, uh, is between the partially negative, let's get this consistent here, partially negative atom of one molecule, in this case the oxygen, and the partially positive hydrogen of another molecule. And so it's gotta be a very partially positive hydrogen. And again, that's why it's only the hydrogens bonded to an F, an O, or an N that are capable of hydrogen bonding. And once again, you'll get a, an attraction here. So, and it turns out that in hydrogen bonding, we actually, it's mediated through the lone pair of electrons on the partially negative atom. And so we often define a couple of different terms here. So for the atom, uh, I'm sorry, for the molecule that has the hydrogen involved in this hydrogen bonding, we call it the hydrogen bond donor. So, but for the molecule that has the lone pair of electrons on the partially negative atom, we call it the hydrogen bond acceptor. And so to be a hydrogen bond donor molecule, you have to have an H bonded to F to O or to N. So, but to be a hydrogen bond acceptor molecule, you have to have an F and O or an N with lone pairs. And so it turns out that every water molecule might be involved in hydrogen bonding with as many as four different molecules. Like if we look at this one right here, he could be a hydrogen bond acceptor through this lone pair with one mo water molecule over here, but I could draw another water molecule up here where he could be another hydrogen bond donor, ex uh, sorry, another hydrogen bond acceptor with this lone pair as well. But he could also be involved in hydrogen bond donors or as a hydrogen bond donor with these two hydrogens with two more water molecules drawn down here. And so, and it turns out this is what happens in ice. In ice, you actually freeze, you know, water into a crystal in which every water molecule is interacting with four other water molecules in a beautiful crystal and structure. So in liquid water, so it's not, you know, frozen in place, the molecules are moving around in the liquid phase. And so it turns out that, you know, typically every water molecule might only at any one instant in time be 
hydrogen bonding with two, somewhere between two and three other molecules. So cool. It's why when you freeze water, it actually spreads out. So when you freeze it and have that perfect structure where you have four uh, hydrogen bond, uh, four hydrogen bonds per water molecule, it actually to, to fit that structure, you actually have to expand out a little bit. And that's why when water freezes, it expands. It's due to this hydrogen bonding. So this hydrogen bonding is super duper 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 important. It explains a lot of the irregularities of water, why it has a rather high boiling point, why it expands when you freeze it and stuff like this. So super important for water acting is what we call the universal solvent in biology, why all organisms are water-based and things of this sort. So super important property. If you want to know, you know, what makes water so unique, start with just saying hydrogen bonding. Now, how does it make it unique? That's another story. We'll talk about some of those things, but the big thing is it is the hydrogen bonding. This is the strongest of these three intermolecular forces. So, and water for a molecular compound has a rather high boiling point at hundred degrees Celsius. So for a lot of molecular compounds, their boiling points are actually below room temperature, which is why a lot of them are gases at room temperature, but water is a liquid at room temperature. And there are some that are solids at room temperature and stuff like that, but water is considered out of, you know, molecular compounds, especially ones of this size to have a fairly high boiling point. And it really comes down to this strong intermolecular force we call hydrogen bonding. All right. So the last one on the list here is what we call London dispersion forces. So, and this one's a little bit tricky. So it turns out that all molecules have these, all of them. Every single molecule is London dispersion forces. Is water capable of London dispersion forces? Yes. So is HCl capable of London dispersion forces? Yes. So all molecules have these, but even nonpolar molecules. If you've got a nonpolar molecule, well, being nonpolar, it's not gonna have dipole dipole forces or hydrogen bonding possible or present in a solution. So the question then is, where's the, what's the nature of this London dispersion force? Well, again, all of these, the nature comes down to plus and minus. So with London dispersion forces, if you've got a nonpolar molecule, so why would it be attracted to another nonpolar molecule? Like let's say you're a nonpolar molecule and I'm a nonpolar molecule. Should there be any reason there should be any attraction between us? Well, not at first glance, except that my electron cloud is in motion. It's moving around me. And so if we freeze right here, then maybe facing you, my electron cloud is a little closer to you. So at this exact instant in time, so facing you, I appear to be a little bit negatively charged on this side of the of my molecule, if you will. And so what you do is then you shift your electrons around behind you so that facing me, you're a little bit positive. And I'm like, oh, hey, how's it going? I never noticed, but you're totally cool. We should hang out. And then my electrons move back behind me and I'm like, never mind. So a uh, London dispersion force, also called Van der Waals force again, is a weak temporary dipole. And it's just due to the motion of electrons in a molecule. And so a couple things you should realize affect these London dispersion forces. So they are affected by size. And surface area. So the larger the molecule, so and we kind of get a, a rough idea of how large a molecule is by its molecular weight, though that's not a perfect metric, because it's also related by surface area. And so molecules that have a greater surface area over which these forces can operate, also gonna have higher London dispersion forces. All right, so all molecules have these London dispersion forces, but if you're nonpolar, that's when it becomes most important because it's the only kind of force you have. You know, if you're water, do you have London dispersion forces? Well, yeah, you totally do. But who cares about the scotch tape if you've got super glue? And so a lot of times for water, we wouldn't talk about the London dispersion forces. So, but from the get-go, you should realize that all molecules are capable of London dispersion forces, all of them. And the bigger the molecule, the more these are gonna be uh, contributing to the overall intermolecular force picture. So however, for molecules that have hydrogen bonding, we're not often gonna look at this just simply due to the fact that if you got super glue, why pay attention to the scotch tape? But you should definitely recognize that they're there. And again, the bigger the molecule, the bigger the London dispersion forces. All right, so these are your three fundamental types of intermolecular forces, and they're important. So when you start talking about some of the bulk properties of a liquid, so how sticky the molecules are, how great the overall sum of the intermolecular forces are, are gonna affect those lovely properties. And so if you look at your hand out there, I go through uh, several properties there and show how the overall intermolecular forces affect them. And so the first one's boiling point. So if you look at a, a typical liquid, so if I got, say, a liquid sitting right here in this container. 
So what you find is that in the liquid phase, the molecules are all in contact. Now they're in motion, they're moving around. So, but they're all in motion. What you'll find out is that every once in a while, one of them will jump out of that liquid phase and make it into the gas phase. And so up here, you're gonna have a relatively smaller number of gas particles or gas molecules, depending on what we're talking about. So because gases, again, are much more spread out than liquids as we learned in the last chapter. And so it turns out the stickier these molecules are, then the more they're gonna to stick to each other in the liquid phase, and the more they're gonna to wanna to stay down here where they're in contact with each other, than be up in the gas phase. And so as a result, you know, to go from a liquid to a gas, so you've gotta add heat and make these molecules move faster and faster and faster till on average they have enough kinetic energy to overcome the attraction force between them. In water's case, that would be hydrogen bonding. In HCl's case, that would be dipole-dipole forces would be the strongest of those forces. So, but again, in every case, it would also have some contribution from the London dispersion forces. So, but the overall picture then is that stickier molecules are gonna take more heat to overcome this attractive force to give them enough kinetic energy to where all of them can get into the gas phase. And so as a result, then stickier molecules, molecules with greater intermolecular forces, end up with higher boiling points. Now, it turns out we also talk about what's called the enthalpy of vaporization. So, and that is the amount of heat at the boiling point that it takes to simply convert it from liquid to gas. And so not only do we need a higher temperature, but once you actually even reach that temperature, it takes more heat so to break all those intermolecular forces at that temperature. And so we say they have a higher heat of, uh, or sorry, higher enthalpy of vaporization as well. And so higher intermolecular forces, higher boiling point, higher enthalpy of vaporization. So, and we're gonna talk, talk about a, a couple other properties that maybe you've heard about, maybe you haven't. So, and one of them is viscosity. So it turns out higher intermolecular forces leads to a higher viscosity. And so viscosity is probably something you've, you know, heard of. So, and we usually kind of have an idea of that viscosity refers to like the thickness of a fluid. So, and that's true as, as kind of like a correlation, a thicker fluid has a higher viscosity, but it's not actually the definition of viscosity. So viscosity deals with fluid flow. And so if you have different layers of fluid, it turns out if you, uh, you know, kind of study the, the physics behind fluid flow, you get straight line flow, sometimes called laminar flow, and you get the, the fluid actually flowing in concurrent layers. And any interaction between the layers would lead to friction between the layers. So, and it's this friction between the layers that is actually termed viscosity. And so this friction is due to the intermolecular forces between the molecules in those separate layers. And if there's a lot of friction between those layers, a lot of intermolecular forces between them, then they're all going to want to flow together. And that's why things that are thick just involve flowing together and pour more thickly, if you will. And that's where the kind of viscosity comes from. So higher intermolecular forces, higher viscosity. All right, another thing we talk about is what's called surface tension. So, and surface tension deals with, like if we talk about the surface tension of water, that would deal with the network of molecules, water molecules, hydrogen bonding with each other at the surface of a liquid. So what if I told you I had a friend and this friend could jump into a swimming pool and walk on water. And you might be like, is his name Jesus? So not the friend I was talking about. So different friend though, this in this case, this friend is a water bug. So, and the water bug can walk right on the surface of the water. And so and it's due to this surface tension. It's actually due to this network of hydrogen bonding. Now you and I, we are just too fat to walk on water is what it turns out. So, so but this water bug is light enough and it's, uh, weight is spread out over a large enough surface area that it actually doesn't pierce through this network of hydrogen bonding between the water molecules. Whereas you and I just break those, that network right as we jump in the water. So, but we call this property surface tension. It's also why if you fill up a glass of water, you could actually fill it up greater than the top of the glass, if you will. So because at the surface, all those molecules be attracting to each other. So, and it allows you to, you know, kind of fill it up just a little bit higher. So, and we call that surface tension. And it's directly related to how sticky the molecules are. And so the stickier molecules, the higher the intermolecular forces, the higher the surface tension. And so these are the four properties of a liquid we want to look at that all correlate positively. So with higher intermolecular forces, higher intermolecular forces lead to a higher boiling point, higher enthalpy of vaporization, higher viscosity, and a higher surface tension. Now, the one that's going to be the uh, a negative correlation is gonna be with what we call vapor pressure. And so higher intermolecular forces actually lead to a lower vapor pressure. 
And so vapor pressure, so if we kind of go back to our diagram here of the liquid phase and the gas phase, the vapor pressure is a measure of how many molecules have made it into the gas phase, into the vapor phase above a liquid. And so, you know, typically if you've got a liquid, you have evaporation going on even below the boiling point. At the boiling point, all the liquid molecules get turned into gas phase. So, but below that boiling point, you still have evaporation taking place. And typically what you're going to have is you're going to have some molecules going into the vapor phase, and then you'll have some collide back with the liquid and go back into the liquid phase. And you'll have what we call an equilibrium established between the gas phase and the liquid phase. So, and it turns out it's temperature dependent and stuff like this. So, uh, but we do have these. And in this case, the measure of how many molecules are actually in the vapor phase is called the vapor pressure. Well, if you have stickier molecules down here with higher intermolecular forces, well, then fewer molecules will be able to escape and you'll end up with a lower vapor pressure. And that's why a higher intermolecular forces leads to a lower vapor pressure. So in a second, we'll, we'll return to this kind of diagram and talk about the relationship between vapor pressure and temperature as well in just a sec. All right, so how do you get, you know, asked a question on this and stuff like this? So, well, most commonly, you're probably going to see this asked in the context of boiling point, probably less so in terms of enthalpy of vaporization or viscosity or surface tension. So you should definitely understand those concepts and those questions we can ask you about those. So, but if you're going to do a comparison, it's probably going to be along the lines of just who's got the greatest intermolecular forces or who's got the highest boiling point or maybe who's got the highest or lowest vapor pressure. So let's say we put some molecules on here and let's say I give you this guy, this guy, and actually let's make that a fluorine so we don't have too big of a difference in size here. Uh, and then we'll put these three. So if we look at these three molecules, we should ask ourselves what intermolecular forces are, are possible for all of these molecules. So and it might require you to kind of have an idea of what they look like. So let's give ourselves a little bit of room here. So all of these have a carbon in the center and are bonded to at least three hydrogens. So in the case of CH3OH, you then have an oxygen and a hydrogen. And because we have an OH bond, we'll be capable of hydrogen bonding, the strongest of the intermolecular forces. And if you're capable of hydrogen bonding, then you're polar and you're going to be capable of dipole-dipole forces, and then you're also going to have London dispersion forces because all molecules have those. Okay, so this guy all of a sudden is capable of all three types of intermolecular forces, so lots of intermolecular forces going on. Now CH3F, you might be like, oh, he's got H's and F, he's going to have hydrogen bonding as well, except it's not true. If we take a look back at the structure here, so instead of an OH, he's now got a fluorine in that position. And so even though he's got H's and he's got an F, there is no FH bond in the structure anywhere. There's no hydrogen bond to the fluorine. And so we do have a fluorine that has got a significant amount of partial negative charge, but these hydrogens right here aren't hydrogens that are bonded to fluorine, they're hydrogens that are bonded to carbon, and they're not very significantly partially positive at all. And so no hydrogen bonding going on here whatsoever. So you gotta be careful. It's not just enough to have H's over here and a fluorine over here. You'd have to have an FH bond or an OH bond or an NH bond somewhere in your structure. So this guy here is a polar molecule. He will have dipole-dipole forces, but he's not going to have hydrogen bonding. And so as a result, he's gonna have less overall intermolecular forces than CH3OH. And then finally CH4, instead of a fluorine in that position, we're just going to have another hydrogen. So, and in this case, this is a nonpolar molecule. Because he's nonpolar, he's not gonna be capable of hydrogen bonding or have dipole-dipole forces. The only thing he's going to have is London dispersion forces. And so as a result, if we're comparing these three, the greatest intermolecular forces would be for CH3OH, and the least amount of intermolecular forces would be for CH4. Which means if I said, which of these three has the highest boiling point, you'd say CH3OH. If I said, which has the lowest boiling point, you'd say CH4. So, however, if I asked you about vapor pressure, you'd have to realize it's a, that negative correlation again. And if I said, which of these has the highest vapor pressure? Well, highest vapor pressure doesn't go with highest intermolecular forces. Highest vapor pressure goes with the lowest intermolecular forces. And so we'd say that CH4 has the highest vapor pressure. And if I said, which of these has the lowest vapor pressure? Well, the lowest vapor pressure has the highest intermolecular forces. And you'd say that CH3OH has the lowest vapor pressure. 
Now, again, you could ask the same question about which of these would have the greatest surface tension. Greatest surface tension goes with highest intermolecular forces, and it would be CH3OH. You could say highest viscosity, and again, highest viscosity goes with highest intermolecular forces, and it would once again be CH3OH. And least likely question is highest enthalpy of vaporization. I just included it to be thorough, just in case. So, but highest enthalpy of vaporization would be highest intermolecular forces, and would once again be CH3OH. And that's kind of the typical kind of questions you'd be asked in this. You might just say, which one of these has the highest intermolecular forces? Well, CH3OH. So, and not even apply it to any of the bulk properties of liquid. So, but again, they could ask it about the boiling point, the enthalpy of vaporization, the viscosity, the surface tension, or the vapor pressure. And you should know how to rank them, again, by classifying their intermolecular forces. All right, so I wanna do one more example here in comparing intermolecular forces. And the last example, all three molecules rather similar in size. So in this ranking of hydrogen bonding being the strongest and then dipole-dipole in the linear dispersion is based on ranking three molecules that are very similar in size. So however, we learned that linear dispersion forces are totally dependent on size greater the size, the greater the London dispersion forces. It is the weakest of the three forces, again, when things are similar in size, but what if they're not similar in size? Then all of a sudden, if you have larger molecules, they can start having larger and larger amounts of London dispersion forces, which might mean it ends up with more overall intermolecular forces with molecules that are you know, potentially more polar than it and stuff like this. And so uh, I want to give you one more basis of comparison for molecules that are not very similar in size. So if we look at CH3OH and CH3F, these two are similar in size. And again, CH3OH, capable of hydrogen bonding, rather strong intermolecular forces. CH3F, capable of dipole-dipole forces, but not hydrogen bonding. And then we've got this guy here. So for a molecule, it's combined, uh, composed of only carbons and hydrons. We call that a hydrocarbon. And because carbon and hydrogen were so close in electronegativity, you might recall that we consider those bonds to be nonpolar. And if all your bonds are nonpolar, then you're going to be a nonpolar molecule. And if you're a nonpolar molecule, then the only intermolecular force you've got are London dispersion forces. So, however, this molecule is not similar in size to the two above it. In fact, if you look, you got four carbons here and 10 hydrons. Four carbons weigh 48, 10 hydrons be another 10. So he's got a molecular weight of 58. If you look at CH3F, so 12 plus three is 15, plus another 19 gets us to 34. And then CH3OH 12 and 16 for the oxygen gets us to 28, plus another four is 32. So if we kind of compare these based on molecular weight alone, we see that this one is significantly higher than either of these two. Well, the way it's usually going to work out in this case, then, if you've got molecules that are significantly different in size, so hydrogen bonding is still probably the main thing. If you have a molecule with hydrogen bonding, it's probably going to have the greatest intermolecular forces if the other ones don't have hydrogen bonding. And that's the case here. We do have one molecule with hydrogen bonding, the other two don't. And CH3OH is going to have the highest intermolecular forces of these three. Still going to have the highest boiling point, highest enthalpy of vaporization, highest uh, viscosity, highest surface tension, and lowest vapor pressure. So, however, in comparing these two, if it's coming down to a difference in one's polar, one's not, but one's larger, one's smaller, well, again, this one's polar. He's got dipole-dipole forces, this one doesn't. But this one's bigger, so he's got greater London dispersion forces than this one. So who wins? So in this case, if there's any significant difference in size, usually on the order of like, I don't know, 15% difference, which this is way more than 15% difference. So then the one that's larger typically is going to have the greater overall intermolecular forces. And so that's going to be the case here. This one is not polar and this one is, but this one's, you know, significantly larger than the other, so much so that it's London dispersion forces will uh, give it the overall greater intermolecular forces between the two. And so this guy would have the second highest intermolecular forces, the second highest boiling point, the second highest enthalpy of vaporization, the second highest uh, viscosity, second highest surface tension, but second lowest vapor pressure, which out of three is still the second highest, I realize. Cool. So then CH3F ends up, even though he's polar and he's not, he ends up with the lowest overall intermolecular forces, lowest boiling point, lowest enthalpy of vaporization, lowest viscosity, lowest surface tension, but the highest vapor pressure. So, and those are usually the two comparisons I give you. So, and I say I, that, that anybody would typically give you. Now, the truth is you can get a nonpolar molecule. If I put enough, you know, size to this thing, you know, make it really, really, really big compared to this molecule, it might even have enough intermolecular forces to have greater than something with hydrogen bonding. But it's not like an easy place to say, well, how big is that? And stuff like that. So we almost never ask you that question. And I anticipate that you're not likely to see it uh, in any of your high school courses anywhere along the way. All right, so two major questions then, comparing molecules of similar size, in which case look for hydrogen bonding, then dipole-dipole, then London dispersion, 
or with big difference in size, you should still look for hydrogen bonding first. So, but if it comes down to just uh, London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces, the bigger molecule is going to have the greater intermolecular forces. Now, it turns out I forgot to talk one little concept that I decided to come back to, and that's ion dipole forces. And we kind of left this out of the discussion entirely, and it turns out this is another type of intermolecular force. And, uh, but it's only one that's going to be present in mixtures, but you have to have something ionic dissolved in something that has a dipole, something that's polar. And so when you dissolve like an ionic compound in a polar solvent, like water, you get these ion dipole forces. And so here, if I take plain old salt, NaCl, and dissolve it in water, you get a couple different interactions going on. So here I've got the sodium ion, which is positively charged. And because he's positively charged, he likes to interact with the partially negative oxygen atoms of all the water molecules. And so they orient themselves to kind of have their oxygens facing towards that sodium. And the interaction between the sodium and these ox these partially negative oxygens is what we call the ion dipole force. And it turns out these are often even stronger than hydrogen bonding, but the key is they're not present in pure liquids. And so like when we were comparing boiling points and surface tensions, those were all for pure liquids and this wouldn't even enter into the discussion. That's why I kind of left it out until now. So but you should kind of recognize these. You should know that they're typically stronger than hydrogen bonding. So it turns out the size of the ions plays a role in how strong they are. Smaller ions have stronger ones and stuff. So, but you're only gonna ever see these in a mixture, in a solution, not in a pure liquid. Cool, if you look at the same thing with the anion, the chloride ion. So with chlorine being negatively charged, it wants to interact with the partially positive hydrogen ions instead of the oxygens. And so the water molecules orient themselves around it to have the hydrogens facing it. And again, we call these interactions between the partially positive hydrons and the negative chlorine ion, uh, ion dipole interactions or ion dipole forces yet again. And once again, they're stronger than hydrogen bonding, but only ever gonna be present in a mixture when you have an ionic substance dissolved in a polar liquid. All right, so I wanna explore vapor pressure for a minute, just to a little bit greater degree here. And we're gonna look at graph at vapor pressure versus temperature. So I've got the vapor pressure here plotted in TOR. And you should recall that 760 TOR equals one atmosphere. And if you got the study guide handy, I've got a nice lovely graph already there for you. So, but there's a relationship between temperature and vapor pressure. And as the temperature goes up, the vapor pressure above a liquid goes up as well. And the idea, if you recall, we said that, you know, there's gonna be some evaporation going on. And when evaporation takes place, the molecules that have enough kinetic energy to break away from the inner, you know, the attractive forces holding the molecules together is going to jump out of the liquid phase and become a vapor. And the more molecules that have this amount of kinetic energy to, to break free, then the more molecules you're going to get up here in the vapor phase. So how do you give molecules more kinetic energy? Well, you heat them up, you give them more temperature, you increase their temperature, so to speak. And so that's why as you increase the temperature, so you end up with a higher vapor pressure. So and we're going to come up with a new definition for boiling point. And so the boiling point, you know, where solid, or sorry, where liquid is converted into gas, and it's spontaneous for the liquid to turn into gas completely. We often think of that as your boiling point and stuff like that. But we're actually going to get a very technical definition here. And we'll find out that it is when your pressure your vapor pressure equals the external pressure. And if you're out in the atmosphere at sea level, that would be one atmosphere. So, and whatever temperature that occurs at, that is your boiling point. It turns out that's the point where it boils. And so if we're looking at vapor pressure, let's say this is of water, like the one on your study guide, then this would occur at 100 degrees Celsius. So, Cool, and that's the way it works. So you kind of like, you know, have an external pressure, you know, pushing, pushing off your substance and you have the vapor pressure pushing back against it. And once the vapor pressure is equal to that external pressure of one atmosphere, that's when it boils. And so you got an interesting thing you could take a look at here. So if you're at sea level, so the pressure is one atmosphere outside and your boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. But let's say you go up to a very tall mountain or something like this. Well, at a very tall mountain, so you have less air above you weighing down on you and you have a lower pressure as a result. And if you're at a lower pressure, well, then you're going to find out at that lower pressure, which would be lower than 762 or lower than one atmosphere, you'd end up with a boiling temperature that ends up lower as well. And so it turns out water boils at a lower temperature when you're at high altitudes. So if you like do any kind of cooking at high altitudes, you need a special cookbook. So because, you know, let's say like at some high altitude, you're now at a boiling point of say 90 degrees Celsius. Well, if you're cooking rice and you're boiling the rice, well, at sea level, it's boiling at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. But at this new altitude, it'd be boiling at a temperature of 90 degrees Celsius. And if it's boiling and cooking at 90 degrees Celsius, it's going to take longer to cook 
than if it were boiling at 100 degrees Celsius. So that's kind of the deal. So it turns out if you actually hook up a, a, a Erlenmeyer flask uh, to a vacuum, you can actually lower this pressure inside that flask enough that you can actually get so your water to boil at room temperature. So I've done it before and you're holding the flask in your hand and the water, you can see it boiling, but it's not hot, it's at room temperature. So kind of a weird thing. So your normal boiling point is where your vapor pressure reaches your external pressure. And normally you're gonna see that in the context of being at one atmosphere. I just wanted to show you why say at high altitudes, uh, you know, your boiling point goes down and things of this sort. All right, so now I just wanna finish this lesson off with some vocabulary that's related to this. And this vocabulary shows up both in a chemistry as well as often in a biology context. And so our words here are going to be adhesion, cohesion, and capillary action here. And so adhesion and cohesion, you want to get these straight. And like when you think of cohesion, so like it's kind of like you're partners with something and, uh, you know, co uh, cooperate might be a good word and stuff like this. And so cohesion refers to attractive forces between molecules of the same substance. So where a substance is attracted to itself. So water is a great example of this. Water molecules are totally attracted to themselves. And a uh, great example of molecules with lots of cohesion are ones that bead up. So when you, you know, as a liquid pour them on a, a surface or something like that, they like to beat up because they're so attracted to each other. So adhesion, on the other hand, deals with, you know, molecules of a substance being attracted to some other substance. And you'll find that water is a good example of this as well with glass. It turns out water is very attracted to glass. So, and if you take a look at your Erlenmeyer flask, and maybe you've learned this in the lab already. So if you fill an aqueous solution or just pure water in your Erlenmeyer flask, so at the top level, it forms what we call a meniscus. So, and the reason it forms this meniscus is partially due to adhesion because the water molecules are climbing up the glass, if you will. So because they're attracted to the glass. And as they climb up though, they're attracted to all these water molecules out here with cohesion. And so actually adhesion and cohesion both play a role. So in forming this lovely meniscus. And so water does this, it, you, you know, studied a, a substance like mercury or something like that, you would find out mercury wouldn't form a meniscus looking like this. So mercury doesn't really like glass per se, and it would actually kind of try to minimize the amount of glass. And it would actually be an inverted meniscus, if you will, it would look very different. So, but this is kind of, uh, special property of water in relation to glass. And we often talk about what's also called capillary action. And so capillary action, if you had what's called a little capillary tube, and it's a very thin tube here, it's so thin so that actually if you dipped it in a solution of water, let's say, so essentially, you know, here with the, the meniscus on the, the uh, graduated cylinder, so it's wide enough that, you know, it's only going to creep as high as the amount of water that it can support in this kind of the boundaries here. So, but if the capillary tube has a, a small enough diameter, so then it's attract enough to the glass that it can actually just keep traveling up. And because it's so narrow, it doesn't have to pull as much other water molecules with it. And what you'll find is that it can actually just travel. The water can travel right up the entire capillary tube and fill the tube. It almost looks like it's defying gravity, but it's just due to the strong adhesive forces between the water molecules and the glass that it can do this. So you'll find the same kind of thing like when you put a piece of paper towel in water. And even though only a part of the paper towel might be in contact with water, you'll find that the water spreads throughout the paper towel. That is another example of capillary action. You find this in trees. So a lot of trees, you find that we uh, uh, assume that water kind of travels all the way up the tree, not because it's pumped, you know, up through the tree or anything like this. So, but it's actually capillary action that might drive it up uh, from the roots to the top, you know, the top of the tree and stuff like this. So lots of biological application uh, to each of these words as well. And definitely a thing you should be familiar with uh, from this lesson. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the best things you can do to help promote the channel. And if you're looking for the study guides that go with this, if you're looking for practice questions, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.